fundamentals of the tradition fundamental teachings so today i'll be focusing on on this lecture i'll be focusing mainly on planning to do four chetasikas for the two lectures ahirika anuttappa tiri and ottappa so they are related because uh, ahirika means the moral shamelessness as we translate anuttappa means moral fearlessness have no moral dread towards doing unwholesome deeds and kiri means moral shame or tapa means moral fear so these are considered very important in the tradition especially for someone's virtue sila when hiri and tapa the positive mental states are present means uh, practice sila very strongly and when the opposite states the negative state ahirika and anottappa when we have no moral shame or moral fear that time uh, the virtue uh, we breach the sila and fall into unvirtuousness so we'll start with the ahirika and anottappa ahirika means it's a mental state which allows the akusalas to appear in the mind without walling them away pushing them away and specially uh, we have to look into ahirika in the perspective of akusalas are something to be disgusted or something to be something repulsive repulsive or disgust in the sense of bringing uh, decrease in our moral qualities and also something which is not appreciated which is not admirable all the akusalas have the nature of burning our burning our mind and also decreasing the moral values and also it is always comment uh, uh, how to say insulted or looked down by the wise in the world so therefore this akusala when we discuss about ahirika we have to take the perspective of looking into akusalas as something which is a uh, bad or which is repulsive repulsive not in the sense of rupa as we talk in asuba but this is something that something that should not be admired something that is that should be disgusted in such a way so that's how the ahirika is explained so then why this uh, why there is uh, such a nature called ahirika present is the theravadins explain because our bhavanga stream bhavanga stream means the our natural original chitta of a being it's like for example we take pati sandhi and the bhavanga chitta chitta is not a one one reality the rise and pass away so this bhavanga stream even in a being who is born in the woeful realm has no defilements associating with it i think we discussed this discussed this point when we come to consciousness When we when you are discussing about consciousness, Buddha mentions pabasana midam bhikkhavi chitta. The mind is bright and undefiled. 
So the commentaries or the traditional interprets this undefined nature is that these chittas, the vipakas, resultants, because everyone is born as a result of a karma. So when it comes to resultants, there is no defilements associating these chittas. Hence, they are bright or undefiled. So when it comes to the jamana level, for example, we have the manodvara vajana and some powerful, strong chittas. We call it uh, uh, impulsive chittas. Right? Impulsive chittas. So at this level, when the defilements, for example, if we take akusalas, if akusalas are arising, ultimately how the interpretation comes is ultimately they are something very uh, polluted or defiled. So this pollution happens in a mental stream, even though the chittas, there is no chittas, these, these chittas have passed away when we come to this point. This mental stream as a one thing is considered as undefined or pure. So this unwholesome or impure nature arises in a mental stream which was originally pure. So this is like some un, uh, defilements coming into an undefiled surface. So this, there is a natural tendency, it means there is a naturally, it, is, it doesn't match. So therefore, the tradition says, a, nature, a mental nature is necessary, necess necessary for allowing these defiled natures to appear within this pure, pure mental, mental stream. So this ahirika, which, is, which all, always arises in our personal natures, ahirika, doesn't ward away or push away these defilements which were latent and coming into the surface, which does, they doesn't push them away, considering them as disgusting. And in the end, what happens when the ahirika is present, these defiled natures will be admired and the person starts to enjoy them. So that is the nature of Ahirika, allowing the defiled natures or the disgusting natures which are called Akusalas to appear in our mind and enjoying or sort of admiring these qualities. So this mental Ahirika becomes very apparent at the levels when we are about to do a certain Akusala. I will come to that point later. So when does this become apparent or very, very, uh, very uh, noticeable? When it comes, because when we are about to do an akusala, if sometimes we feel this is not proper for me, so that is the time that the opposite state we call the hiri, which we are going to discuss in the next lesson. Hiri, when hiri appears, we try to push it away. But if if ahirika is present, we don't see it as something in, inappropriate, and we embrace it and we follow our desires. So this ahirika appears according to tradition, arises with all the akusala natures. What is the fundamental necessity is the mental stream is originally pure, undefiled, according to the Buddha's statement in the Anguttara Nikaya. Then when our unwholesome states appears in such a pure mind stream, even though the chittas have passed away, we take it as collectively we take it, because they have an effect to the following chittas. So in such a pure mental stream, when an unwholesome defilement arises, which are something repulsive, repulsive in the sense of uh, considering their natures compared to the kusalas, repulsive natures, the, there is a mental concomitant or a chetasika which, allow, which allows their arising or which allows them to uh, occupy our mind and eventually enjoys or appreciates their existence. So that is the nature which is called Ahirika. So I will be reading the handout. The first paragraph, 5.68. Ahirika is the mental concomitant which allows unwholesome mentalities which are disgusting to arise in the mind stream. Bhavanga stream of beings is undefiled since it does not have any associating defilements. On the other hand, I have given the reference. On the other hand, wholesome mentalities are defiled and should be disgusted. For these impure natures to occupy the natural undefiled mind stream, there should be a nature which allows their arising. So there is a simile given by one of the teachers and also in the commentary literature. They say the pigs and uh, dogs can eat the excrement 
but uh, a same person, humans, normally there is a natural, this is just an analogy or sim simile, there is a natural uh, resistant in within us. When we have, when we make, uh, smell that, uh, smell, uh, smell excrement or taste it, we have a natural resistance to push it away or to go away from it. So the pigs and uh, dogs doesn't have that uh, resistance and their minds welcome the smell and uh, uh, this unpure nature. So likewise, when this, uh, un this polluted, unwholesome natures are arise in a pure mind stream, there should be a mental force or mental power allowance which allows these mental uh, impure natures to appear in such a pure mental stream. So that is the analogy given. So pigs and dogs have a certain mental nature which enables them to eat excrements without feeling any disgust. Humans do not have this nature within them. So when they smell or taste excrement, a strong uh, revulsion arises in them, dragging their mind away from it. In the same manner, all the unwholesome mentalities associate with a certain mental nature which does not reject the arising of revulsive uh, unwholesome akusala natures within the naturally undefined menstrual stream. This nature is called ahirika. This is how ahirika is explained. And this ahirika is opposite of hiri. Hiri is the moral shame. Moral shame. So, actually, these four are interrelated. It is when when we understand all the four four natures, hiri or tapa and ahirika or tapa, we get an overall picture about what they are. So, hiri means a moral shame. What what does moral shame means? Moral shame. So, according to this teaching, we have to come into a fundamental rule according to Buddhism. Kusalas are good and akusalas are bad. So based on this theory, we explain hiri otappa ahirika anottappa. So it is not uh, relative. It is absolute. In Buddhism, we talk about absolute good and absolute fault. It's like dosa is good, adosa is adosa, dosa is bad. Sorry, adosa is good. It's not something relatively discussed, right? So likewise, when we say moral shame, moral shame is the uh, feeling of a person of feeling shy or ashamed to do something uh, bad or akusala. So when this ahirika appears in the mind, it's, it prevents the arising of moral shame. It doesn't allow the moral shame to happen. So the mind embraces the akusalas like a, a dog embraces or eats excrement and we tend to do un unvirtuous things. So then a question comes, why these unwholesome natures are to be discussed? As? What are the reasons? According to our teachings, if you go into 68.1, so all, ultimately all types of unwholesome natures are defiled. So something which is impure should not be admired and embraced. So therefore, akusalas are something to be discussed because this reduces our moral purity and also decreases our moral values. As a moral person, as a virtuous person, our value decreases when these uh, stains appear in our mind. Then conventionally, conventionally the moral, the akusalas have to be worn away, uh, should be pushed away because of few reasons. So one is the age. The commentary gives, you can look into a uh, commentary, I'll give you the reference later. Based on age, are you? based on age. So when we grow up, sometimes we feel certain acts are not proper with the grown-up age, right? So for example, I've given an example, some unwholesome deeds are greatly inappropriate with the age of their, of their doer. For instance, indulging in sensual acts at a grown-up age like 60s seems awkward in many Asian countries. Right? So when you grow up in some cultures, with your age, they say this is not proper in, in, in uh, these acts are not proper to a, to a person of your age, right? So this is a one way that conventionally, I'm not telling it's ultimately, this is conventionally how akusalas are considered uh, repulsive. Ultimately, they are defined nature. It doesn't matter which age they appear. They, are, they will de decrease your moral quality. Conventionally, this is how akusalas, one way of considering akusalas are repulsive. And the second is the status. 
A status means like you are a monk for a person like a monk. It's it's not pro proper for monks to do sports or go into a party. It seems like because of the culture and right? because of the uh, how to say uh, social uh, environment, it doesn't feels good, right? So based on the social status, we sometimes look into certain akusalas as repulsive. Then uh, some unwholesome deeds does not fit with our uh, uh, some tribal clan. These are always conventional. For example, if you look into the Sakyan clan, Buddha's tribe. So actually, it was a tribe. The Sakyan tri tribe. They considered lying is very inappropriate. So even at the cost of their lives, they did not lie. So it, this is how uh, another way of uh, considering akusala as repulsive. The finally, certain qualities that learnedness or your uh, bravery so these qualities or some 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 akusalas does not match for example if a learned person starts to unnecessarily doubt about small things or a wise person start to doubt about some certain things it seems like we would say why you are so learned but you cannot handle your own mind so these kind of uh, 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 accusations may appear. So this is another way to look into the akusalas uh, as disgusting or uh, inappropriate things. So these are conventionally how you look into it. Ultimately, they are defiled. So regardless your state of your status, age, your qualities, they are considered as bad according to the tradition. Yes, sir. Very question. Sorry? A sports. A sports, okay. <laughs> oh, that is okay. Okay, I understand. Okay. okay. So this is uh, okay. Uh, in, in terms of uh, exercises, I would say sports is good. But uh, when you are in a, a spiritual status like a monkhood, uh, we normally uh, abandon these things. We have different ways of making our body exercise. Right? Sports that you have to involve in loba and those. If you do a sport, for example, right? If you are playing with each other. But uh, if it is not, uh, how I define sports is you do like you play rugby or you play cricket or something like that. So this, uh, this is not uh, conducive to your moral practice, right? Spiritual practice. So that's why the Buddha has prohibited monks playing, right? So it's, 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 it's in terms of our, our status is why we became monks for a specific goal it doesn't match with our aim that's why otherwise not uh, sports is not bad that's not because of not not because of that right and also when you do sports normally you get the loba chitta or dosa chitta right? mostly right? <laughs> okay so in that sense it doesn't match with the point. that's why i mentioned now that, uh, uh, yeah otherwise it's not like uh, looking down on sports right so then uh, uh, this uh, ahirika is a mental power we call it a bala which prevents the mind from, the, from prevents the moral shame arising and makes our mind into uh, like or appreciate the unwholesome state so we call it a ahirika bala this ahirika now it's another uh, important point it related to all the four realities i will be making this uh, uh, classification we have ahirika and ahirika bala Bala is power, strong ahirika. All the ahirikas can be called bala in terms of some uh, explanations, but here I am referring the strong ahirika is called bala, the powerful one, when it is very strong. So, what is the nature of ahirika? It doesn't look into the akusalas as something disgustful, so it doesn't push it away, it embraces, it allows it to come. So, this presence of ahirika becomes Normally, they arise in all Lakusala Chittas. I will come to that point at the end of the lecture, why they are possible in all Lakusala Chittas. But their presence become most conspicuous when we are about to do a certain Akusala. When we are about to do a certain Akusala, if the Ahirika is present, for example, if you take a monk, if Ahirika is present, he may not see the uh, meanness of this act. For example, think a monk is going to drink some alcohol. So if Ahirika is, is there, if Hiri is not present, he may, he may think, okay, it's not, it's not a big deal, so he may drink the alcohol. But 
he will do it secretly because he knows as a monk it is not a pro appropriate thing because as a being representing a spiritual uh, spiritual personality and taking the veneration from the society uh, representing as a virtuous person if you breach such a such a such a uh, deed uh, such a virtue it's not proper so then he may he may drink it but secret but if the ahirika is so powerful it comes into a very higher level of bala he may even invite he may not bother to invite a lay person to join him so what does it mean it means like it's if you drink it alone it shows that still you have a certain kind of a moral shame that it's like you know it's not good and you do it secretly but if he invites another lay person he knows that it will be exposed and he doesn't care about it so this kind of when the ahirika is powerful we we extend our akusalas to beyond our uh, restriction borders like it becomes like we feel like why this person have no shame or what so likewise more the ahirika is powerful more the akusalas we can do and we doesn't feel ashamed of doing certain things so if you go to the next page we there is a vinaya term used for a monk who has very strong ahirika who has very less moral shame moral shame uh, very less moral shame or very powerful moral shameless these are called alaji you can find this term in vinaya vidaka alaji so the term comes from lajadi laj to be ashamed of right to be ashamed of laji means one who has moral shame who considers about the accusation of others and also one's own purity but if someone doesn't have such consideration he doesn't he doesn't bother about the sila and breaches the rules as he like according to following his desires such a monk is called alaji alaji monk is like this is a different there's a difference of alaji and a dusila Dusila monk. When you are talking about monks and nuns, Dusila means one who has committed the parajikas. He has no sila, so he is not considered as a monk anymore. Alaji means still he has some kind of moral shame, so he hasn't broken the uh, parajika rules, but the minor rules he doesn't consider and he breaches them according to his desires. He doesn't worry about them or purify them. So these are called alaji monk. Alaji comes. from because of extreme level of ahirika he has no moral shame so there are very famous six monks in the buddhist tradition who are all considered as alajis they are champakya bhikkhus right this is called extra knowledge champakya so you normally have the group of five panchavakya who got enlightened for the first time right champakya is very different they were very famous of breaking the rules when the buddha lays and lay down a rule they find a certain loophole and try to do it in the other way then buddha had to make another rule right some there were some groups their chambakiyas were divided into three groups main six monks uh, each have 250 followers all together 1500 chambakiya bhikkhus were there a lot and they lived in three different areas one lived in rajagaha one one group lived in the savatthi and the one group group lived in kutkithagi so one was like one group was they would breach they would do inappropriate things and when the buddha laid down a rule they will not do it and they will do something else they would do something else and buddha had to lay down a rule another group was they when the buddha has laid down a rule they will find a loophole and do something uh, uh, somehow to uh, uh, go through it the other group was they were breaking the rules without any consideration so they they we find three types of groups at three different levels of ahirika so these are alaji monks so uh, chapadias then uh, these are the name for uh, ones who doesn't have any moral shame less moral shame they do have moral shame that's why they are not dusila yet dusila means they breach the parajika rules then they lose the monk state of status of a monk so these alaji monks come because of Uh, excessive level of ahirika there are three characteristics of a alaji person i have given it in the handout so how to define a alaji person sanchitcha apatti apachit he commits offenses deliberately that is a one one characteristic apatti parigruhati 
he conceals his offenses without purifying his sila from the committed offenses and do not bother about his impurity of the sila. He doesn't care whether his sila is pure or not, whether he has done something wrong or not. He just keeps on living. He doesn't bother about looking here. The last one is very serious. Agati Gamananta Gajati. He ex adopts extremes such as anger or favorism when he is being questioned about his offenses. Someone questions about his faults, he gets angry or he starts to call back, he starts to find a fault in the person or just he, is called, he looks down upon the binaya. So likewise he goes into extreme extremeness knowing what is correct and wrong. So these are the characteristics of an allergy person. Even someone commits offenses deliberately, deliberately offenses can be committed. The subcommentators say, even someone who commits the, commits the uh, offences, if he has the intention to purify himself, and if he knows, for example, there are some rules called Sanghadi Sesas for monks, if these are committed, they have to go through a long procedure. So this procedure cannot be done all the, all the time or everywhere. We have to go to a specific place and follow the procedure. So it takes a long time. So uh, monks who have committed Sanghadi Sesas offences, Still, they consider how much I have often committed or how many days I have concealed and they keep a determination, one day I will purify from these offences and purify themselves, still they are considered as Laji monks. Laji monks means they still respect the sila. So it seems like when you look into the literature, it seems that to consider as a Laji, you have to have all these three characteristics. It means they deliberately commit the offences they don't consider about the purification and also they come into extremeness and they try to defend themselves showing fault answers or wrong answers like uh, counter counter questioning one who asks the questions or bringing something which is not in the doctrine for example these things are okay for these times so it's, it's not it's not a serious offense so something like why right, they they bring uh, their arguments of this so these are the characteristics of allergy person and allergy person is because because when you look into the dhamma point of view according to the teaching there is no person or a being who exists as, as we consider. It's just a combination of mind and matter. So within the mind stream, there are different elements we call chittas and chetasikas and with different natures. Among these different natures, ahirika, when the excessive ahirika is there and he follows his desires, at that time, we call him an allergy person. Otherwise, there is no such a person called allergy. We give the name because of this excessive uh, shameless in the mind and because of his acts, right? So this is how we interpret a, wrong, uh, a person of such caliber in terms of Abhidhamma point of view. Yes. Okay, so I'll be proceeding to the Anottappa, the next mental concomitant. So this is moral fearlessness. So Akusalas were considered as something to be disgusted and now we also consider according to the Buddhist perspective something to be afraid of something fearful like it brings lots of dangers so it's like a fire fire if we touch a fire surely it will burn our burn our burn our hand so likewise we we keep very good distance with it and we are not going to play with it so likewise when the akusalas are adapted in our mind if we if we, if akusalas arises in our mind and if we act upon them they are going to bring lots of ill results, ill consequences to our life. So therefore, they are something to be afraid of or something to be kept away from our mind. So that is, so this anattapa, what does it do? It allows these akusalas to come into our mind without having any moral fear. Moral fear here means there is no such a resistance in the mind in terms of considering about their about their uh, fearful nature it means they embrace them by suppressing the moral fear so it's against the moral fear and it allows the mind to come into uh, allow the akusara chittas to come into the mind the exact simile is given in the books uh, a person wants to go to a, a sort of a dangerous place haunted by ghosts but he normally is afraid to go there Unless he have assistance of another friend or another equipment will, that will protect him. So when he have the confidence, he would dare to go into such a place. So likewise, when these dangerous, unwholesome natures are going to arise in our mind stream, 
There is a mental concomitant which is called anottappa, which reduces our fears and makes us brave, makes us bold enough to embrace these akusalas and to follow and to adapt them into our lives. So this also happens because the mind stream is pure and it doesn't have a, uh, how to say, it is, it is undefiled. So when such natures are going to happen, which are going to disturb our serenity, which are going to bring lots of ill results, whether we know or not, these natures are, are, have, are something quite dangerous. So the mind doesn't have, a, doesn't have a awareness of or doesn't consider these natures as something dangerous and they allow it to come. So another point is this ahirika and anottappa are greatly related with ignorance. Ignorance is not knowing the truth. So ahirika and anottappa are outcomes of ignorance of moha. So they are very much related. Moha is not knowing the truth. Ahirika is not considering or not knowing the repulsive nature of Riyah Akusalas. Anottappa is not knowing they are dangerous and, and embracing them, making the mind brave to follow the desire. So follow the orders of the Akusalas. Yes. So, so you mean um, it's like making the mind brave in the face of these consequences is, is kind of like a, like a future amnesia. You know, like, like choosing just not to see what will follow. And like this is the source of the bravery. Yeah, that is also, yeah, that is, that is the fundamental source uh, nature here because he doesn't see it. So what happens whether he purposely ignore it or not, he gets some, uh, because there is some, how to say, this, this uh, how to say, Akusala natures are, sometimes when we explain it seems like you know it and you are going to do it like you know the consequences you ignore it and you follow it but actually when they are universal unwholesome natures what i personally because there are no such detailed explanations on this what i personally feel is there is it doesn't allow the mind to look into this dangerous nature and makes the mind to work on it there is no resistance on it. Because when the Akusalas are adapting in our mind, it normally gives, uh, uh, it destroys our serenity and it brings lots of discomfort to us and to others. So the mind doesn't see it, mind doesn't appreciate, uh, mind doesn't look into this and it just ignores this part and it keeps on working on it. So that's what I meant as bravery. Right? So, uh, so then uh, the mind becomes bold enough to follow the desires when the anottappa is present, right? So likewise, when the uh, when there is uh, assistance, so anottappa become the assistant to our our mind to adapt akusala nature. So I'll be reading the paragraph because this is the main paragraph of the of the paper. Anottappa is a mental concomitant which allows unwholesome mentalities, which are frightening in the mind stream. Akusala. Akusalas bring lots of troubles both in present and future lives, hence are frightful mentalities. A person who is aware of the consequences of Akusalas would never perform unwholesome deeds. They can be done only when there is a mental state which removes this fear towards unwholesome mentality. An ordinary person cannot go into, into a fearful place like a house haunted by ghosts without the assistance of another person or a thing which can remove his fears. When he has the adequate assistance, he will boldly go into the place in the same manner mental, a mental state is required, allowing fearful and unwholesome states to arise in the mind stream and that is called Anottappa. The Anottappa is present, when Anottappa is present, beings they are to do various evil deeds without hesitation as some insects jump into the burning flames, right? It's like they don't see the danger of it. Anottappa is opposite of moral fear, which is called Anottappa. In an occasion which unwholesome deeds are to be done, Anottappa prevent the sense of moral fear in the mind stream and makes the mind brave in doing evil deeds. So that is the nature of Anottappa. Then why should we be afraid of Akusalas? That is the list what I mentioned. Ultimately, unwholesome mentalities bring pain and trouble in the samsara in terms of karma and its results. Some evil deeds bring punishment in this very life, Danda. While arising, they bring discomfort and prevent mental tranquility. It destroys our tranquility. That is very obvious. A doer of evil is accused by the wise. And Akusala brings self-regret to some when we get to know that we have done something wrong. So likewise, these natures are something to be afraid of. 
So therefore, but this anuttappa doesn't allow the mind to look into such aspects of the akusala, and especially the most apparent is it destroys our dis comfort, it, de it destroys our tranquility, it makes our mind, for example, anger. So that's why we normally say, don't make me angry, right? You know, it's, 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 it's something not very pleasant. So, but when it comes to that some, something undesirable, we adapt it. Our mind allows it to come. So when, now, when we grow in spirituality, our mind starts to uh, be aloof from these akusala natures. At that time, the presence of ahirika and anuttapa, when they arise, when we embrace them, when we do, when we just ignore the ill consequences of akusala, when we just ignore the bad sides of akusala, their impurity, that time the ahirika, anuttapa becomes prominent to us. If the mind is always occupied by akusala, a person may not feel this. A person may feel that this is not something natural. But when you grow in spirituality, when you have spent a lot of time without doing any akusala deeds for a while, and when you are about to do such a thing, then you see the dangers and the inappropriateness of the akusala. That is the time moral shame and moral fear becomes very apparent. But even at that time, if we start to uh, uh, take the akusala and follow our desires, that is the moment ahirika and anuttappa is very apparent. So the example is given, uh, anuttappa also becomes a bala. Anuttappa is also, can become a bala. Bala means the power of the mind. So I have given an example with the monks, uh, monk sila. Uh, monks also have a rule called Sangha Visesa. When you commit it, you have to go through a long procedure. And this brings lots of discomfort. Yes. We, are, we are afraid of Akusala not only because of Kamma Vipaka. We become afraid of Akusala because of the accusation, because of the discomfort, because of the troubles that we are going to face. A person may not do uh, stealing public property because Normally not because most of them don't, don't do because not because of fear of vipaka because if they get caught right, you have to be in the jail right lots of problems with it. So this is also a nature of uh, moral fear. Fear means fear out of punishment, fear out of akusala vipakas and fear out of accusation and fear out of self-regret which is the most difficult as far as I consider most difficult to get rid of self-regret. So this uh, uh, now a person a monk uh, who has uh, yeah I've given a, it becomes uh, apparent uh, oh no sorry the monk's example is given to Ottapa sorry so Anottapa is now someone wants to thinks about stealing a gem he may go and steal a gem from a shop but he still knows there is a danger but he his mind doesn't consider all these dangers and he boldly take the action, uh, take, uh, follows his desires and goes steal them. But if Anuttapa is very strong, very powerful, he may even try to steal a gem from the king's chamber. Because it's a very dangerous thing, the decision is more grave, if he get caught, he's going to be punished a lot. So likewise, when lot, a lower Anuttapa, Anuttapa, a person may not, may be able to kill a certain animal. But with very high anuttappa, he may even be able to kill a human or kill his parents. So likewise, the more powerful the anuttappa is, more dangerous the kamma we are going to follow or to uh, get, so uh, to do. So likewise, ahirika and anuttappa, so I'll be concluding the lecture now. Ahirika is the moral shamelessness which allows the disgusting or repulsive akusala natures to appear in our mind. Anuttappa is the uh, feeling which suppresses the moral fear and which embraces the akusalas bravely and adapts them and follow follow what they suggest us to do. Then these uh, anuttappa and ahirika are present in all the akusala states. They are present in all akusala uh, chittas and uh, because uh, these mental states, another. <coughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, they are present in all Akusala natures and they are related with moha. They are outcomes of ignorance. So the mind doesn't look into the dangerous aspects or the repulsive aspects of the Akusala and we ignore it. We try to follow our desire. So that is the uh, main point. And because of excessive Adhika, we have uh, in Vinaya, we call a person one who breaks the rule without any shame. We call an Alaji person. Lajja is the moral shame, one who doesn't have this Lajja is called Alaji. And, uh, but more the Anottappa is powerful, people, uh, the humans may take brave decisions to do a lot of Akusalas. To conclude the class, the final state sentence in, uh, in, in Anottappa, page number 60, before hearing. Lady Shadow mentions that heroism in doing evil deeds is mainly owing to Anottappa. Whereas bravery in doing wholesome deeds is mainly due to Kusala Virya, right? So why we become brave to do like killing humans or genocide or doing a world war or the showing their bravism in unwholesome deeds because we, they don't see the dangers of these Akusalas ultimately which bring lots of ill results to your own self or, or, and to the others. So this has to be explained. These two chetisikas have to be explained in the perspective standing upon that Akusala are bad, they are repulsive, and they bring ill results. Yeah, these are the points I would like to discuss. And the next lecture, after the break, I'll be looking into Hiri and Ottappa, and then uh, discussing about them in uh, uh, overall uh, about how they function. Yes. Any questions? Yeah. But brave and uh, diligent, they are totally so diligent. Diligence is. Uh, I translate the word sura. Yes, yes. Diligence. Diligence. Yeah. So, what is your question? Uh, brave is another nature. You mean bravery? Bravery means he doesn't stop. He just keep on doing. He doesn't. For example, whatever the difficulties come, he doesn't stop his endurance, uh, efforts. So that is mainly because of effort. Right? Whatever the difficulties... Someone may be brave, but lazy. Someone may be diligent, but... Uh, oh, okay. Maybe my translation. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, bravery here means not uh, bravery like... Uh, the, the word comes as sura. Sorry for that. The translation is wrong. The word comes as sura. You can see sura. Sura means one who is brave, one who doesn't stop and keeps on following his objectives, right? So, what my, my intention was to show that he, a person, keeps on doing akusala deeds. Even the, uh, his friend, society would say, don't do it, but he still keeps on doing. He doesn't see the dangers. But a person may keep on doing the wholesome deeds. It's we normally call it's because of your wholesome effort. That's my intention. Any questions? Yes. One question. For example, uh, if uh, a person is afraid of uh, doing something because of the fear of the uh, Ipaka that will come, yeah. I mean, uh, the Ipaka result will be the same regardless if he knows about the result or if he doesn't know. The Ipaka yeah. is the same or it will be different. Thank you for your question. I think you got the question, right? So he's asking someone, uh, you, still you do the Akusala, right? Still you do the Akusala. Someone does the Akusala knowing that it's going to give results and someone does the Akusala without knowing, right? So as uh, simile is given by Venerable Nagasena on this matter. He gives, uh, there are two iron balls, right, iron, one is hot and one is not hot, no, right, you cannot uh, uh, distinguish which one is hot and which one is hot, not hot, right, so, uh, yeah, sorry, not, not two balls, one, one, one iron ball, but this one is hot, right, two people are there, one knows that it is hot, the other doesn't know it is hot and both wants to touch it. 
So he asked the question from King Melinda, whose hand will be burned more? Of ones who knows it is hot, or ones who doesn't know it is hot. So likewise, when someone does an akusala, even knowing people sometimes do akusala, that is the nature, right? It's difficult to control. Even monks do akusala. So when someone knows that they, it will bring ill results, his eager urge for his uh, intention, his interest in doing the akusala will automatically reduce us. So then the power of the intensity of the volition is reducing, all the uh, uh, force of the akusala natures would reduce because of his understanding of this nature prior to doing it. So automatically the power is going to reduce. But if someone doesn't know this, he is going to do it with full force because he has no restrictions in the mind. He are not, he's not going to bother about it. And it is going to have the intention of the intensity of the Chetana is going to be very powerful. So it is going to give more powerful results. So according to Theravada, according to Buddhism, if someone does Akusadas knowing it's going to give results, and someone does Akusala without knowing it's going to give results, if, uh, how to say, if we do the same Akusala, naturally, the one who knows it's going to give results, will, his mind will have a less intensity. So therefore, it's going to give lesser results than a mind with higher intensity in unwholesome children. That's how that is. Okay, so then we'll take a break and... Okay.